Well, our series on the great things found in the Bible uh, has come to an end. So here with the uh, first Sunday in September, we're starting a new series, and it comes from a, the book of 1 John. Now that is not to be mistaken with the Gospel of John. John the Apostle wrote the Gospel, but he also wrote 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. And then comes the book of Jude, and then the Revelation, so it's at the very end of your Bible. Okay, And so uh, 1 John, is a, the, they're in size order. The Gospel of John is bigger. First John is next in size, second John, third John, they just get smaller. And in the book of John, we want to focus with a theme of what you really need to know. What you really need to know. And I picked that theme because of some of the background information in this book. Some form of the word know is used 41 times in this small book. 41 times, <clears throat> there are only 105 verses in the book. And so that means it occurs about every two and a half verses. The word no occurs. When a word occurs that many times, it's obvious that the author is trying to communicate to us something that we really need to know. And that's how I pick my theme here, what we really, really need to know. Now, a little more background about uh, what's going on. John is writing because there's a controversy, a heresy that is going on. It's Gnosticism. And Gnosticism comes from the Greek word gnosko, which means to know. These people who were held this heresy uh, believed that they had a deeper knowledge. They knew more than the Apostle John and the, the apostles who were with Christ, and they had a deeper knowledge. And if I could just kind of boil and oversimplify, boil it down and oversimplify this, their main concept is that the physical is evil and the spiritual is good. Now, the heresy that arises out of this thinking that all that is physical is evil and only the spirit is good is that Jesus Christ then could not have come in body because if he had a body and it was evil and God is good and holy, he could have never taken a body so Jesus did not come physically or they did not believe the person attributed to be Jesus was God. And so he's writing in response to this idea uh, that uh, Jesus Christ truly is God come in the flesh, and, and he's not questioning the God part, but he's questioning them on their part about him coming in the flesh. And so he wants to make sure that they get it. And so he's saying, first of all, Jesus Christ is real, is real, all right? I'm not sure I got all the underlining in this version of it because I was not connected to the one cloud here at the church to upload the underlined version. So you'll have to watch while you're taking notes and just uh, kind of fill these in on your own. Jesus Christ is real is his first point. He says, we have heard, that's underlined, okay? You put that in. He, we have heard him. That's what he says, very first verse. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard. He's saying, we heard him. He, he's real. Jesus is real. We heard him. Secondly, we have seen with our own eyes, which we looked at. He said, look, look at, I'm not making this stuff up. I heard him speak. I saw him perform all these wonderful miracles, the Sermon on the Mount. He said, we, we've seen him. And our own hands have touched him. Wow. To those who would say that no, Jesus didn't come in the flesh, that he was just some phantom or ghost, uh, he's just blowing them away. He's saying, hey, listen, we handled him, we saw him, we talked to him, we heard him, and he said, and this is what we're proclaiming to you. We're communicating, we're proclaiming, we're telling you that which we actually scientifically empirically verified that Jesus Christ came in the flesh he says concerning the word of life the word of life John wrote the gospel of John as well as first John and he begins in the beginning was the word same word here the eternal logos the logos of life in the beginning was the word, and Lagos is capitalized in English because it's a name. It's the name of Jesus before he became flesh. He was the eternal Lagos. 
He was the exact expression of the Father because he was equal with God, according to Philippians chapter 2. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the with God there is pros in Greek, and it comes from the word prosopon, which means face. He was with God the Father face to face. Although God is spirit and immaterial, and so he's saying but. He, he, he was with God from all eternity. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The two are equal. The Bible teaches very clearly in the Trinitarian concept that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are co-equal, co-existent, co-eternal, all three of them, because the Lord our God is one God, expressed in three persons, the eternal Lagos. So it says there, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things by Him were made, and without Him was not anything made that was made. You see, He precedes all creation. He precedes all creation. So He's not just some phantom, some ghost. He's, he is the second person of the eternal Trinity who took onto Him flesh. In fact, if I were to jump down from verse 3, in John chapter 1 down to 14, it says, and the Word became flesh. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. It's just a few months away, you know. <laughs> you know, because of the shortages on the shelves, they're telling you to start doing your Christmas shopping now. <laughs> at Christmas, we're going to celebrate. The eternal Son of God, the Lagos, took to his divine nature a human nature, and the two were joined together for all eternity. They are not commingled as to be some weird thing. He is 100% God, and all that God is, 100% man, but the person, the person is divine. He is the Son of God. He didn't acquire a human person. He is a divine person with a human nature and a divine nature. So he is not a split personality. He is the eternal Son of God, Jesus. Jesus, come in the flesh. That's what he's saying. Listen, the one from the very beginning, we have heard, we have touched him, we have seen him, our own hands have handled him. Listen, we're proclaiming to you this word of life. That's how he starts us off to say, listen, Jesus Christ is real. He is real. The second thing he nails is that eternal life is real. I love this part, don't you? He says, the life appeared. Whoa, eternal life appeared. And we have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim it to you. Eternal life, which was with the Father, and has appeared to us. Now listen, this eternal life is revealed, is revealed. How many have ever seen a picture of this statue in Gloucester, uh, Massachusetts, on one medical vacation that we took several years ago? Uh, we had to go to uh, uh, Harvard's Hospital, Boston Mass General, and, and uh, so while we were out in that area, we made our way up to Gloucester, and we saw this famous, uh, the man at the wheel, it's a statue dedicated to all the fishermen who went out to sea and never came back. It just so happened while we were in Gloucester, that day they were unveiling a new statue. So we were there. This is pretty cool. We just randomly were there. That's the way it goes for us often on our vacations. Oh, man, did you do this? Well, we did only because... It just so happened the day we were there, it was going on. We, that's the way we travel. Anyway, they're about to unveil this one. And we, so we were there, and we watched. And they unveiled the fisherman's wives statue. And she's there with her kids waiting for the, the, the fisherman who did not return. This is in honor of the families, not those lost at sea. Now, the reason I did this, let me back up. The word appeared is revealed, revealed. Revealed means it was covered up and then whoosh, it is exposed. It's revealed. You can now see it. 
This passage is saying the life, the eternal life, in Jesus Christ appeared bodily. You see, Jesus Christ has eternal life. Most of you know this verse. Okay, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. The next word is crucial. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Eternal life is in him. When Jesus came, eternal life came. Look, he says, it appeared, and we have seen it and testified to it. We proclaim it. Eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. Wow. He's saying, eternal life is real, and it was embodied in Jesus Christ, whom we have just testified to you. He is real. Eternal life was observable. We saw it in body form in Jesus Christ. He said, we testify to it. We proclaimed it to you. And he also says, this is eternal life. My son David, when he was probably about eight years old, nine years old, came in the room and said, Dad, I got this terrible headache. I said, oh, okay, well, well, maybe I should get you some aspirin. He said, no, no, not that kind of headache, Dad. He said, I've been thinking about eternity. It never ends. It never ends. And it's making my head hurt. (laughs) Think about it. It goes on and on and on and on. And it never ends. Everything we know ends. The movie ends. Dinner ends. You name it. It all ends. Life here on earth ends. But eternal life goes on forever and ever. And he was trying to get his head around this. And it was Dad, it's making my head hurt. I have a headache. Listen, this eternal life is what we have in Jesus Christ our Lord. That should make us a pretty fearless and courageous people. Because to die is gain. So I should not worry about anything in this life. He's got the whole world in his hands. And then after that, he's got eternity too. He says, this eternal life was with the Father and has appeared to us. Now, the next thing that is real, Jesus Christ is real, eternal life is real, and here's the one I really want to get to. Fellowship with God is real. And that's probably supposed to be underlined, and you're supposed to mark that one. Fellowship with God is real. Do you notice the footprints in the sand? Yeah, how many know that poem? You've heard that poem, Footprints in the Sand? Yeah, okay, Footprints in the Sand. And you've got two sets of footprints here. And in the poem, at one point, there's only one set of footprints. And then uh, the guy's complaining, Lord, you're supposed to be with me all the time, and then why, why are only my prints in, in the sand? And, and the poem goes on to say, it's because when there are only one set of prints in the sand, I was carrying you. <laughs> yeah, footprints in the sand. Amos says this, can two walk together except they be agreed? Wow. You can't walk with God if you're out of ingre- agreement with God. Another way of putting this, if I'm living in sin and he's a holy God and paid for my sin, but I'm deliberately living in sin, how can I be in fellowship with him? How can two walk together except they be agreed? Do you know God created us to walk with us? I know that from the book of Genesis. After he created Adam and Eve, he placed them in the garden, and in the cool of the day, the Hebrew text says, the voice of the Lord came walking in the garden. That blows me away. A voice is walking. Well, it implies that. There was a manifest presence of God who came down, and in the cool of the day, this voice and Adam, they communed and they talked. There was an agreement. Why? Because Adam hadn't sinned. But once Adam sins, he's not walking with God in the garden. However, the high priest, when he would go into the holiest of holies, and God has manifested himself in a Shekinah glory, the priest is said to have walked with God. There he is once again, walked with God. You see, God created us to walk with him. He wants us to have fellowship with him. He wants us to commune and talk with him. He speaks to us through his word. We pray to him and we speak to him, and we have a real relationship. We're in fellowship with one another. It says, listen, it's personal. God personally wants to have a relationship with you where he walks with you. He walks with you. Tells us in Genesis chapter 5, Enoch, well, actually in Hebrews chapter 11, referring to Genesis chapter 
uh, 5, it says that Enoch walked with God and was not because God took him. <laughs> Enoch had that relationship with God, and God one day said, Enoch, this is such a great relationship. I want you to come home with me. And he was gone, taken to heaven. Wow. He said, we proclaim, there's the we, it's personal, and we have seen, there it is, it's personal, we. He says that you, he's talking about you, a person, may have fellowship, that's the key word here, fellowship with him. We have fellow, you may, may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and the Son. He's saying, listen, we should have fellowship with one another, fellowship with the Father, fellowship with the Son, fellowship with the triune God. Listen, Fellowship with God is real. What I'm trying to say is you and I can walk with God. We can walk with God. Sometimes I'm driving with God. Because <laughs> I'm driving down the road and I'm just talking to God. You know, because there's nobody else in the car with me. My windows are all up. And I'm just talking to God. Now, sometimes when I'm driving, I should be really saying, Lord, take the wheel. <laughs> you drive, and I'll sit here, and I'll listen from you. You lead me where you want me to go. You see, that's, that's part of that conversation. I'm having a relationship with the true and living God. He said, fellowship with God is real. That's what he's telling his people. In fact, he's so excited about it. He says, we write this to make our joy complete. The Apostle Paul, uh, Apostle John, uh, this isn't him, but you got the idea. It, he is so excited that there's this group of believers who believes like he does, and, and not like the Gnostics, and he says, we write this to make our joy complete. This makes us happy. Listen, fellowship with God is theological. The word... Theos is God. It's God word. There's theology involved with this fellowship. He said, this is the message we have heard from him. And we have declared to you, God is light. Now, I didn't know how else to illustrate that. But if you just imagine, that is a blinding light. <laughs> okay, God is light because it says in him there is no darkness at all. I think if we were to really see God, remember the Old Testament, you can't see him and live, because it would be so overpowering. God is light. God is light. He wants us to remember that. In John chapter uh, 1 the very, of the Gospel of John, he tells us in like the fourth verse, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. Very interesting. God is light. He is the source of our life. The life and the light are connected. Eternal life and this light and the holiness of God, the purity of God. It's all intertwined. This is theological. We serve a holy God who is pure. He is bright, brilliant light. God is light and in Him there is no darkness at all. None. None. When Jesus hung on the cross, he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Most theologians take us back to the, the book of Habakkuk. Where in Habakkuk it says, God is of purer eyes than to look upon iniquity. So when Jesus was on the cross and our sin was imputed to him, put on his account, and he was suffering and dying... God took his eyes off of him. He's too pure to look at the sin placed upon him. He cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because God is light. Now, if that is true, and I say I have fellowship with God and I'm walking in darkness, I'm not telling the truth. God is light. God is light. It's very practical, because he goes on to say, just as I was saying, if we claim to have fellowship with God, oh, I got this relationship with God, I'm holding God's hand, and here I got your picture of holding God's, my hand holding the, the light's hand, okay. And, and I, I'm in fellowship with God, but actually I'm walking in darkness. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Huh. We lie and the truth is not in us. If I say I'm walking with God and I'm living in deliberate sin in my life, I lie and the truth is not in me. 
But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, you see, I, I, God is not coming down and living in my sin. He's already paid my sin. He's not going to live there. He's already paid for it. So I've got to come out of that and I've got to come up to him. How do I do that? I've sinned. He said, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. Wow. But you and I know that, that we don't do that. Yeah. I get on my knees and I pray and say, Lord, here I am again praying for forgiveness of the same old sin, right? Hmm. If we, we have fellowship one with another, if we walk in the light as he's in the light, why? Because the blood of Jesus Christ the blood of Jesus Christ purifies us from all sin. Now, you may not know who this is. Anybody here know who this is? Awesome, awesome. Yeah, this is Martin Luther. Okay, not Martin Luther King Jr. Okay, don't get too confused. All right. this, this is the guy that Martin Luther King Jr. was named after, Martin Luther. All right. Martin Luther was a great reformer, and he was held up in the uh, Wartburg uh, castle during the Reformation, and, and uh, people were out to get him because he was declaring, a person is saved by the grace of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ alone and not by any works that we have done. And the church was selling uh, indulgences to buy people out of purgatory to raise money for the, the St. Peter's Basilica and he took a stand against it wrote 90, uh, 60 C's, uh, lines of things why that was all wrong and, and he championed he was championing the doctrine you're saved by grace alone he's in the Wartburg castle and uh, he falls asleep and while he is asleep he has a dream I would call this a nightmare, okay? Any of you ever had a nightmare? Oh, yeah. The nightmare was this. Satan appeared in the room. I don't know how many of you, I don't have too many dreams with, with the devil coming to me, okay? But he did. He had this dream. The devil came to the room, and he said, basically, Martin Luther, who in the world do you think you are? You have so much sin in your life. And then he started naming them and listing them. And Martin Luther, in this dream that he felt was so real, okay, he said, they're all true, it's all true, and much more. And then, and then the devil continued listing more sins in his life. And he said, they're all true, they're all true. And next to his bed, there was a, a nightstand and there was a, an ink pot, okay? That's back before we had ballpoint pens, you know, you put the quill in there and you, 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 you would write. There was this ink pot because he would sometimes awake and write things. There was an ink pot there. He said, they're all true, they're all true. And much more, he took the, the, that, that ink pot, he took it and he threw it at the devil. I mean, not in his dream, for real. He threw it at where the devil was in his dream at the end of his bed and it went across the room, splashed against the wall and for years, they finally took a, and covered it up, but for years that ink blot was on the wall. But when he threw it, this is what he says. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. They're all true. All true. Hmm. Isn't that great? Purifies us from all sin. Now, some of us have a self-deception, okay? Self-deception. And that is, if we claim to be without sin, we say, oh, I don't have sin in my life. I, certainly, we don't count some things as sin in our life. Oh, no, 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 I, I, I'm okay there. Truth is, I once met a man who claimed he'd never sinned. He visited me, he stopped in at, at the church, came in, I was going to gospel with him, and I was sharing all have sin, fault. And he said, I've never sinned. I said, you've got to be kidding. So I went and I tried. So on his way out, we went to his car, and I looked down, and I saw that he was driving with bald tires. I said, oh, come here for a minute. 
So you know it's against the law to drive with tires like that, and that would be breaking the law that is sin. <laughs> and he said, no, it's not sin. I just got bald tires. <laughs> he's denying. He's denying. We live in an age of denial. Listen. You see it all the time in politics. Doesn't it drive you crazy? We've had so much lying to us. So much lying to us recently. I, I don't. This was an extra, uh, extraordinary, extraordinary success in our withdrawal. Come on, are you kidding me from Afghanistan? That was not. But if you tell yourself or you tell someone a lie long enough, they begin to believe it. We all at times claim, I'm not so bad. He says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. If I say, there's no sin in my life, I'm okay, I'm fine. We deceive ourselves. Oh, there it is. We put on the mask. That's why I got that mask there. We cover it up with this lie, this lie. And the truth is not in us. Listen, there's a solution to our sin problem. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins. All I got to do is confess. Now, the word confess is con with fess to speak. I have to admit, I have to say the same thing God says about it. Too often a confession goes like this. Father, forgive me for all the things I've done wrong. That is not... A, uh -uh. Father, I lied to my... And then you name it. I stole. I cheated on my taxes. You know what it is that the Spirit is pricking your conscience. You have to name it. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just and will forgive. The word forgive means to release. He lets you... Let's go... Uh, he lets go of your obligation to satisfy the judgment for that. And he clears your conscience for, this is what he says, and he purifies us from all unrighteousness. The word purifies, cleanse. There's a book out like this. It's by Consumers Report. How to clean practically anything. And it does. It tells you how to get blood stains out. It tells you how to get wine stains out. It tells you, you name it, grease, whatever it is. You, but you know what's missing? How to clean a guilty heart. But the Bible tells us how to clean your guilty heart. How to purify your, your conscience, your evil conscience. How, how to do that. It's the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, that cleanses us from all sin when we confess and admit, Lord, I have sinned. Forgive me for what I have done. He releases us from that and purifies and cleanses us so that I am like brand spanking new. When I come in and I pray and I say on my knees, Lord, here I am again, the Lord says, what do you mean again? Hmm. He's released me of that and he does not hold me accountable for it ever again because Jesus Christ has already paid for it and he restores me to fellowship so that I can walk with the Lord and he with me. Wow. That's the solution. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleansing us from all sin. He makes us righteous. He purifies us. He cleanses us. If we claim that we have not sinned, we have made him out to be a liar. We're saying, God, you lied. Because your word says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And his word has no place in us. Wow. Wow. So what do you take away from this passage today? What do we take away? Number one, this is what you really need to know. You need to know that Jesus Christ is real. He is the Lagos, the Son of God, who came and became flesh, and he went to the cross, he bore our sins so that we would have forgiveness of sins. And when I sin, I confess my sin, and he cleanses me from all unrighteousness. Wow. 
We, we get from this passage that eternal life is real. If Jesus is real, then eternal life is real because eternal life is in Him. Eternal life is real. Fellowship is real. You can have fellowship with God. You can have fellowship with God. You can walk with God. You walk with God because you're in fellowship with Him because you're confessing your sin. When it happens, you confess it and you're back in fellowship with Him and you have this relationship with Him. You read the Word, He speaks to you. You speak to Him in prayer. You go about your Father's business. You're doing the things He wants you to do as He wants you to do them. You're in fellowship with Him. And finally, deception is real. You can deceive yourself and say everything is okay when it is not. When it is not. Here's my final thought. The Lord has told you what is good. And this is what he requires of you. To do what is right. To love mercy. Here it is. And to walk humbly with your God. God wants to walk with you. Do you want to walk with him? Confess the sin in your life. And he'll purify you and he will walk with you and you will have fellowship with the true and living God. Wonderful passage of scripture worth memorizing. (laughs) Worth memorizing. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are about to partake of the Lord's Supper and you've told us to do this in a worthy fashion. And by that we're to examine our hearts to see if there's anything between us and you or between us and someone else. Lord, we're to confess that sin to you because you're faithful and just to forgive us and then partake with a clean heart, clean hands before you. Lord, I do pray that as we enter into this part of our service that each one will examine their hearts and that you will reveal to them what they need to confess in their heart unto you, O Lord, so that when we partake of these elements, we too sense that cleansing power in the blood of Jesus. I ask this in his name. Amen.